Suppose you lived in a country that did not have a university that ranked in the top 500 universities in the world. Suppose you lived in a country that did not have an internationally accredited hospital. You would be in a country that could not train its own doctors, its own architects, its own nurses. And there's no better illustration of the meaning of that than in the present situation with respect to Ebola. 15 million people are in three countries with less than 1,000 doctors. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the importance of higher education. And I want to focus on Africa. For 10 years, I served as chancellor of MIT and had the honor of working with partners around the world as they addressed the question, how can we make higher education part of our strategy for national development? I worked with partners as close as Mexico and Ireland, as far away as China and India and Singapore, in the Middle East, and in Southern Europe. And everywhere there was a recognition of the need not only to take action to advance higher education, but to take stress actions aimed at moving beyond the comfort zone that those nations and those people had experienced in the past. It became my passion to advance the same passion for higher education in Africa. There were a few initiatives over the time that I worked with other countries, but the passion was not there, and there was often more resistance than there was initiative. So why was this the case? There are three reasons to explain the slow progress, and in some cases the backsliding, on the African continent. Keep in mind that there are 53 countries with more than a billion people, or about 14% of the world's population. The first reason is the long tail of colonialism. Colonialism ended in Africa about 50 years ago in most countries. And during the colonial period, it was not in the interest of the colonial power to advance education. And often they did not limited elementary school education, limited secondary school education, and limited tertiary education except for those few Africans who were allowed to act as bureaucratic functionaries. They did not prepare students for law or medicine. Those young people, including the father of our president, were sent abroad. And still it is the case that more than 200,000 Africans study outside Africa. But as we struggle in this country, worrying about why only about 30% of our residents have a college degree, in Africa, 3 to 5% is more typical. The second reason is related to Africa itself. While there's been considerable progress in recent years in advancing democracy and in promoting civil society, in economic development and the emergence of a small middle class, that still is relatively modest activity. And so much more press is given to the still serious problem of corruption, weak government, and a limited civil society. Universities do not emerge out of whole cloth. They emerge because there is a public commitment to them, or they emerge because there is a civil society that emerges to support institutions that are created to advance particular purposes. For example, during the Civil War, there was a gentleman who, whose name is uh, Barton Rogers uh, who decided that there were no institutions in the US prepared to take on the challenge of the Industrial Revolution and all that that required in terms of training engineers. He went all across the country and to Europe and back and decided that he would create such an institution. That became MIT. Now, I want to make it clear that there are people working very hard on initiatives in Africa. Indeed, I visited one institution, the Asheshi University in Ghana, where 
a Microsoft executive who is Ghanaian, decided that he would have the similar vision that Barton Rogers had in Massachusetts. And the Ashesha University was born about 10 years ago, and it was born first class and remains first class today. But that's 600 students. And there are a few other examples I could mention. The Aga Khan University, for example, has created a medical school. And they train doctors. And it is one of the two universities outside, uh, university hospitals outside of South Africa that's internationally recognized. So let's be clear, there is some progress. But there is so much more that remains to be done, to be transformed. The third reason is points us to look in the mirror, or re requires that we look in the mirror. Until about 20 years ago, the official policy of the United States, of Western Europe, of many of the international organizations, was a policy called structural adjustment. And structural adjustment said that African nations would be punished, punished, if they invested in education, health, or human services. So while Singapore and India and China and Brazil and other countries that were in a similar situation going back to the 50s were making great progress in advancing their higher education system, Africa was not only not supported, but it, was pun it would be punished if it took initiative. So that's how we got to this problem. And the problem is not getting better even though I could give you li a list of small efforts which are actually quite good, for a billion and a half people, we need big numbers, and we don't have them. We don't have them even in South Africa, where there is a system in place. It's not big in countries like Nigeria or Kenya that, in relative terms, are wealthy. But that wealth is all extracted from Africa. It does not turn around in African foundations, in African civil society, or even in African government. So we have to have a transformation. And that transformation is what I'm personally committed to and what I think we must all be committed to because we have decided that it's important to engage fully in the world, that it's in our best interest that students in China and India and Brazil are all well-educated because they become our partners. We cannot ignore the 15% of the world's population in 53 countries in Africa. So what would constitute transformation? There are four things. First of all, there has to be an engagement on the part of Africans in their own transformation. We cannot tell them what to do. They must embrace it. They must allocate or reallocate their own resources. They must change their rules. They must make it possible for others to be helpful. And they must be consistent about it. One decade, two decades, three, four, five decades. The second part of this transformation is the transformation that occurs among us. And when I say us, I mean our government, our foundations, our universities and corporations, all of whom are deeply implicated in everything that happens in the world. When I said that the African economy is driven by extraction, where do the products go that are extracted? They're in the iPhones in our pockets. They're the diamond and gold jewelry that we relish. They're in the materials, including food and clothes, that we consume. So when we're able to buy a shirt for $50, uh, we should ask who makes the shirt, who grew the cotton, and how much of the $50 are they getting? Now, I believe, in part because I know the people involved, that there is a disposition to be helpful among our corporations, among our universities, in our civil society, and among our philanthropists. They, to the person, to the organization, would say, what can I do to be helpful? But we haven't been able, up to this point, to give them an answer. And so they, we, walk around the problem, 
looking, hoping that someone else will take the step that would allow us to then join in. That's the second. The third requirement is what I would call scalable excellence. Now, if we were to take, do a little arithmetic, and we were to take a billion people, and we would do any kind of math, it would come out to be a trillion dollar solution to the problem that I've just described. We don't have a trillion dollars. We are not going to have a trillion dollars anytime soon. But whatever we do, however much of a stretch we make, and I believe we can make a stretch, it has to be a stretch which is founded in excellence, which can then be scaled. A Sheshi University graduates probably two to 300 students a year. They can't go to 10,000, but they can go to 1,000. And then they can go to another 1,000. And then they can get bigger and other institutions can follow. That's scalable excellence. That doesn't cost a trillion dollars, but that does cause, call for a step up in the support from us. The fourth is critical. This is collaboration. We need a mechanism by which all of us who want to be helpful, all of us who have resources that we are not dedicating to Africa, but we would, we need a way to engage. There needs to be a table around which we can sit and or with whom we can collaborate so that we can create initiatives which will be transformative. And they will obviously have that potential because there has to be the first gift and then there have to be compounding gifts based on progressive success. That's what is required. Engagement of the Africans, engagement on our part, models of scalable excellence, and new venues for collaboration. It is urgent that we do that. It is ur urgent that we develop some passion about it. Because no nation on Earth, no nation now, no nation has ever, developed sustainable development, social or economic, without the identification, development, deployment of their own talent. We can't leave 15% of the world's population out of a game that is increasingly recognized and embraced. Thank you very much.